prostitution is at the heart of a lot of debates, even whether you call it prostitution or sex work, means uh, that you've some, somehow chosen to look at it in a particular way. We never really looked uh, at it as a form of female oppression on the one hand or as a form of fantastic female entrepreneurship on the other. We were always quite agnostic about it. We just said there's money being exchanged for this activity and it's huge. It's connected to migration, it's connected to crime, it's connected to drugs. And the extent to which it is connected to these things uh, depends largely on how it is regulated. I am Marina, I am an economist, I teach at the University of Reading where I also got my PhD. I became interested in social norms because uh, I am Italian originally. This is a country where social norms are very different across different regions and the whole idea of how people conform with social norms and how that dictates their choices was something that I really wanted to look at when I specialized after my undergraduate. I thought that would be an interesting thing to carry on studying and I could learn a lot that wasn't just true of my country but of a range of other countries in the world where there's a whole range of formal and informal ways of doing things that maybe isn't captured quite so well uh, within economics in general, uh, or this wasn't at the time, people started getting much more interested in social norms uh, um, as, as time went by. So what started out as a kind of rather far out project became uh, something a bit more mainstream uh, over time. That piece of work was uh, motivated by personal experiences. So I noticed that a lot of people like me who had come to the UK as migrants, uh, when they had children, they were concerned that their kids would fit in, uh, but at the same time wanted their kids to preserve some of the values that they come to the country with that made them sort of distinctively carrying two cultures with themselves. We all tend to expect children to want a very stable environment, but the reality is that children don't really have terms of reference uh, as to what, what would be stable for them. So they like their habits on a day-to-day -day basis, but they're not really hung up about what comes into those habits or what shape their family should be or their house or the neighborhood they live in because they don't know anything else. The question of of what values get passed on to children and how well they can cope with encountering different situations uh, is something that is not typical of an immigrant parent. It's something that every parent has to face. They also throw back at you the limitations that you have in viewing the world. That whole idea that their well-being hinges on being well-adjusted, as in kind of stable is, is probably wrong. You know, children are evolving and growing. The ability to adapt uh, and, you know, resilience is, is the possibly the most important component of well-being. A lot of the psychological research as well is throwing up this importance of resilience and the ability to actually adjust uh, to what life throws at you. In the meantime, the whole question of uh, migration and how people integrate well or, or less well in, in the countries that they migrate to became very prominent in political terms. And, uh, and so we started thinking about the general way in which not just one family integrates, uh, um, but uh, the general way in which communities integrate within a host country or not. And you could have different models also of integration of migrants. So you could have a melting pot a bit like here in the United States, but you could also have rather more isolated communities like you tended to get in the United Kingdom and what that means uh, in terms of preserving the original values and at the same time getting some kind of diversity in the culture but when it all goes well that's not a problem when things start going less well then all of a sudden these communities are very identifiable and therefore you know, they can incur large costs so we were trying to sort of tease out those trade-offs and try and figure out what they meant for different countries there's still a lot in that work that that is interesting and can tell us a lot the stigma that is carried by uh, engaging in a profession like sex work uh, impacts the well-being of the people who are in the trade. We realized that there just wasn't much work that economists had done that looked at prostitution from an angle other than a form of crime. And because we had been doing so much work uh, on looking at formal and informal uh, women's work and gender, uh, we thought, okay, this, this may be a good arena in which to look both at uh, what, what it means uh, to be doing a job that carries stigma and uh, what it means to look at gender relations and social relations broadly around something which is a worldwide industry because sex work exists everywhere and has always existed. Regulation very often um, is driven by the concern to reinforce a certain moral standards for a society and, and flies totally in the face of actually getting good welfare outcomes for that same society. 
in that sense, it's a typical um, area for an economist to look at because it's about the interplay between morals uh, and what goes on then in markets. We were interested not just uh, in the sex workers themselves, but the outcomes for society at large. So, you know, it's a transaction that involves two people. So there will be clients, there will be sex workers. They're not necessarily all clients are men and all sex workers are women, actually. So there is interesting gender dynamics going on there as well. Of course, there's a range of other actors involved, intermediation and all the rest of it, and very different outcomes depending on how it is regulated. You know, within the United States um, itself, there is a wide range of different regulatory regimes for sex work across, uh, across states. And it means different things uh, for pub public health as well. Politicians tend to view it as a kind of public nuisance uh, and a kind of public morality type issue. The reality is there are a range of people who work in this for whom this is, this is a livelihood opportunity. And it's also the reality that there is a demand for this. So some of what the project involved, at least at the start, was actually talking to a lot of sex workers in different segments of the industry and, uh, and trying to talk to also outreach services, which are often set up by former sex workers themselves, but also with the Home Office in, in the United Kingdom and, and with policing services and immigration services uh, discussing what the dynamics of this workforce were and just generally trying to understand what would be the best way to regulate uh, prostitution. And from a sort of pure, again, welfareist, if you wish, perspective, it's fairly obvious that you know, uh, pushing any activity in the shadows is not going to improve the welfare of anybody. And also thinking that you can eliminate an activity or you know, adopt a model where you're sort of uh, trying to save people or rescue people uh, from those jobs uh, doesn't necessarily work or doesn't necessarily work for everybody. The gender dynamics uh, in different countries determine very much uh, how it is regulated but also how the different segments work and the degree of agency uh, that, uh, that the sex workers have in the different segments are also very different and you know, they reflect on their earnings, they reflect also on the stigma that the activity carries and what they can do to disguise it uh, or when the activity is more acceptable to consider it as part of the skills they have. You know, there's a lot of the economics of it that is still there to, to be investigated really.